uh, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining uh, the first lecture of this series that we have instituted titled uh, uh, in a conversation around small town histories. Uh, in fact, uh, most part of our understanding of urban histories have been mostly about big urban centers, uh, you see, in which Delhi, Bombay, and many other bigger centers dominate, uh, Amritsar dominate. But we often neglect uh, small towns. Uh, and small towns uh, neglect ka itna bura hal hai ki wo sirf, uh, uh, historical neglect nahi hai, wo literally uh, uh, it's a neglect of all kinds huh, from infrastructure point of view. Huh? So small towns in that particular way uh, have always been towards the periphery of both historical and administrative and cultural point of views. They are thought of as kind of residue of the entire process of both nation state formation and otherwise also of larger sphere of administrative and other cultural debates. So what this project tries to do, however, uh, uh, and these lecture series would want to do is to bring uh, uh, a sense, to bring credence to uh, an intellectual debate around small towns. And in the process of doing that, uh, we would want to investigate small towns through some of the very local uh, connected uh, uh, dynamic dimensions which inform the making and unmaking of these small towns. Now, the project, uh, the series in which, within which the, uh, uh, the discussions will be held are actually part of the larger project, uh, a six months long project in the first stage, uh, which is a project of the yeah. Corporation of Bohar. Uh, this project uh, entails to, uh, if at all it works over a period of time, to uh, build a city museum for this small town. And the idea is to to think of the ways in which the city and its elite and its common gentry, uh, its present and yeah. other uh, dimensions associate itself with the memory of past. Huh? Uh, now, we are thankful to the Municipal Corporation of Bohor for instituting it. And um, uh, what we are going to do beside this series of lectures, we will also be having a series of podcasts. Um, there are six neighborhood exhibitions planned in the city, within the city, one of which will be ready by the end of this month or early next month. And then followed by that, we, the set of these interactions that we will have with the city and its gentry, its students, both young and old uh, uh, community and its citizens, and then try to see the making of the city. Um, uh, and these dimensions will be informing both enriching us and uh, enriching the city in the dual process because the project also wants to institute a small internship program wherein the attempt would be that with a set of these six fellows who have become seven fellows who have become part of this project, there will also be a way in which we will be able to give back to the city through this particular engagement. Uh, I am thankful to all of you for joining this particular uh, lecture series. Um, uh, some of the teachers of my own uh, university from where I studied have joined. I thank you them, uh, thank them also for please uh, for having joined today. Now I will hand it over to Pavas, who, who will take the proceeding forward. Thank you, Yogesh. Uh, hi, Surajit. Welcome to the first lecture. Uh, I'll just begin with team introductions. As Yogesh just mentioned, that we are the Abhor History Project Fellows. Uh, and uh, my name is Pavas. I am from Delhi. I am uh, a graphic designer by profession, and I am handling uh, design for this fellowship. Uh, personally, I am interested in uh, migration and uh, the sense of home and uh, immersive storytelling. Uh, next, we have Sukhveer Singh, who is uh, uh, a fellow who comes from Kot Fateh in Batinda. He is a B.Ed. and an M.A. in History from Central University of Punjab. His work lies in education and the literary history of Abohar and uh, his personal interest also extends to collecting and reading old documents uh, that are uh, being found uh, through our research process. Uh, then we have Nikhil, who is uh, an MPhil student from AUD, an MPhil in history. In the past few years, he has been working with various research organizations on urban and labor histories. We also have Amritpal Singh, 
who is a PhD research scholar from the Department of History in Punjab University, Chandigarh. His interests lie in religious traditions, popular religion, and culture of the Punjab. Next, we have Prachi Satrawal, who is a fellow that joins us from Delhi. She studied architecture from USAP in Delhi, and her interests lie in urban history and participatory design. And then finally, we have uh, Sidra Qureshi, who is from Old Delhi. She graduated from Delhi University and is a postgraduate in history from Ambedkar University. Her area of interests lie in feminist and women history and marginalized community. Last, we have Vicky Gaba, who is, in, who is a fellow, who is a local fellow. His study is in mechanical engineering and he is a par farmer by profession. He is a very uh, crucial part of this uh, cohort of people because his interest, his interests uh, date even back before this project was sort of initiated. So we have a lot of resources, uh, local resources, and he's a great local resource. His interest, he lie, his interest, interests lie in history of Punjab and collecting old documents. And with that, I conclude the introduction. Yogesh. Hello. Yeah. Yes, yes, thank you, Pavas. Thank, thank you very much. much. Uh, now, now I welcome uh, uh, Surjit Sarkar, who has joined us very kindly to give us this yeah. first lecture to us. And uh, uh, Surjit uh, has been associated uh, with Ambedkar University Delhi for a very long period of time. Besides his professional experience, being a filmmaker, being a designer, artist, and many other things that he has done uh, uh, at in various degrees at different parts of India and world, what is particularly relevant to his talk for this project today is his deep engagement with the Center for Community Knowledge at AOD, where he has uh, he started this interesting exercise of uh, neighborhood museum project. And part of it actually what we'll be doing in the Bohor is in a way borrowing a lot from uh, what the center has done over a period of time. Uh, and his expertise also in digitization, in creating archival material, uh, AOD in itself has created these two interesting archives, one on uh, Dilli Ki Yade and another archive, which is titled uh, uh, an archive of uh, maritime histories, all of which have been done under the guidance of Surujit Sarkar. So I am thankful uh, to him and for having accepted this invitation. And we are so glad uh, that he has come today. So in his talk today, uh, with, uh, without wasting much time, he will be sharing with us uh, some dimensions uh, through which we can understand uh, the representation and remembrance of a small town or a city. Uh, Surajit, over to you. Thank you, Yogesh. Uh, thank you all th for inviting me here. I mean, I really wish that it was possible for me to be in Abohar right now. I was telling Yogesh yesterday, you know, after this, I really have to come there. There is no way I can't. Like, I must make a confession. Uh, many years ago, when I was like, I was barely 19 or 20 then, I'd gone to Sri Ganganagar. Uh, essentially, I was from Jodhpur, I'd gone there and uh, I'd gone as part of uh, a team from the Central Arid Zone Research Institute. They were looking, the Indira Gandhi Canal had just come up at that time. and the first of the salinity questions had come up. And uh, I knew the gentleman scientist who used to work there. And he said, Chalna. So I said, I'm game for traveling always. So I said, Chalo. I didn't realize that today I'm talking to people in Abohar, which is actually not very far from Sri Ranganagar. Uh, so maybe someday I will fill up that gap as well soon. Uh, OK, but moving on to more interesting things. You know, I'm very excited by this. Uh, idea that you people have started of uh, doing up a kind of building up a people's history of Abohar, how we how people see the city, how what memories they have of it. It will, of course, I'm sure have some uh, tech kind of library research, some kind of uh, other kind of research, which is not oral histories at that level. Uh, yes, but what you know, what really strikes me about Abohar is that I was looking at this Imperial Gazetteer, which is there on the bottom of this cover slide that I've created. And at the bottom line, you see the words, the place is now of no, 
Actually, it goes on to say the place is now of no importance. And I'm thinking to myself, in 1905, somebody decided the place is of no importance. Did he even talk to the people who lived there? There is no way a place, even if two people live in a place, it's important. It's important because why do only two people live there? At some point, were there only two? Or did one become two? Or were there 2,000 and it became two? There's a story there. And that story will kind of actually define an understanding of not just that place where the two people live, but also what has happened to the people who are connected with them and how those connections have remained. And I see the Avohar story as uh, something about not just finding out what you can see in Avohar today, but using memory to find out what have been the linkages with the past in Avohar, which memory, as we know, and uh, I also discover you've already been following memory through the partition interviews that you've been doing at Avohar. Fascinating, because it's really a way of digging through memory. And I'm sure when talking to them, elements have come out with you people, people who are living in Abur, may have said, Haan, yaar, hota tha, hum bhool gaye. we have forgotten. I'm sure things like that must have happened. Anyway, let me now move to the first slide. I've tried to arrange this in a few ways. The photographs that you see here have not been clicked by me. They've been mostly given by Yogesh and a few which I've dredged the web and found out. So, but I know very little about it. So it's like out of conversations and written records have figured out what these places are and what they could mean. But as an outsider who has no idea, looking at these places, I'm immediately struck in some ways. And it is what strikes me and could help you kind of build up leads into exploration is what I want to talk about. So when I look at landscapes of history here, we see the Darga on top of the mound, the mud fort. Uh, I would love to see this place someday. But what actually struck me was this photograph I found on the web, which shows clearly a brick structure beside the people who are walking, those two kids who are walking beside them. And I'm thinking to myself, clearly this was a settlement, a very active settlement at some point of time, maybe a thousand, couple of thousand years ago, Harappan and so on. Did people even imagine? Okay, so I, I don't know where I was at, but I just want to talk about this mud fort and the kind of uh, different kinds of life happening around the mud fort from the Darga on the top to the brickwork. So life in the past is the brickwork that you can see in the mud fort itself. And uh, I, I did mention about, uh, while it is possible to get, you know, archeologists to say something about it and the Darga people to say something about it and people who talk about it what else this mud fort could be. It might be interesting as oral historians to find reason to bring two or three of them together into conversation. Uh, that needs a, that's not impossible, but usually from my own experience, it makes very interesting uh, information come out because uh, each one is trying to kind of give their own point of view. And sometimes they say things which otherwise they would not have easily said. And as oral historians, that's one of the things you're trying to do is find historian, uh, find uh, information that doesn't come in easily. Okay, I move to the next slide. Uh, other part, you know, landscapes, natural and man-made. We know of the Black Buck Sanctuary nearby. Uh, what I also want to talk about is, you know, Abohar is the way it is today also because of water and the canals. And this, it started with the Sirhind Canal. I mean, the historians, you know, the Sirhind Canal was once when the first time water came around to this side in quantities that allowed it to become uh, the place it is now. Uh, it might be interesting to dis uh, find out what have been different perceptions at different times about uh, both the natural heritage of the area, the Black Bird and the Bishnois on one side, and about the arrival of the canals and what it has meant. Uh, they did, did any of these events, whether it was making the sanctuary or the coming of the canals, it may, must have brought in people, but did it kind of marginalize other people as well? Uh, did it marginalize groups uh, or were there people who never came there again after, in a, after a point of time? Because you know, when you're talking about something as important as water, in this area before the canal, what was done for about water? I mean, uh, clearly there was water, otherwise the settlement would not have been possible. But how much of it was there? 
uh, how, did people uh, you know treat water in a different way uh, i'm sure if you kind of talk to uh, your grandparents who would in turn would have talked to their elders and you will discover a kind of lean, a kind of trajectory about how water was seen in the place you know observances around water i mean there would be the remnants in some ritual about how water is kept aside or not wasted you know which refer to certain things in the area which which may not be easily known but if you dig a bit again you'll find uh, i am saying this partly because of uh, a little bit of experience in in the ganganagar and and jodhpur that side where even there when the when the uh, when the rajasthan canal came in it kind of changed the landscape totally but it's only in the few rituals of the elders you notice that uh, it's just through observation you notice the way they revere water is not the way the present generation does and this is clearly about uh, the access to water that has determined it that might be an uh, area to kind of follow up with and uh, about uh, the nilgai and the black buck there would be a lot of stories about hunting here in the past there may be none happening now but it's not possible that in the past it wasn't colonial history might give you some encounters but there may be others as well some accidental some uh, planned it might be useful to see the differences between them now what i'm telling you now is from a person who's like an outsider who has never been to abohar but has been there about in that area and it's coming out of you know a little bit of what i would call accumulated experience that i'm trying to share with you uh similarly i discovered we, we all know kino and abohar right i discovered this visiting card and i'm thinking to myself clearly a lot of change has happened with the arrival of the kino right uh and one of the things that would have happened is uh different kind of labor practices different kind of factories and uh, skills would have been needed but also it would have meant something to the way trees were seen you know because there's a difference between seeing greenery in plantations and greenery which is kind of natural and rare in a place like this how has it kind of uh, it must be reflected in literature that would be a very rich source local literature would be a very rich source of seeing how trees and greenery are remembered uh, i'm not talking here specifically about the kino because to me the kino is just an entry point into the into the plants and herbs and trees of the region and uh, literature would be definitely a very important um, area also one of the other things is when when trees become plantations whether it's kino or poplar or whatever or the ones that or the other ones are, are around there uh, they involve importing labor people coming in to work on these uh, then there would be reflections about this in lit local literature maybe in you know uh, local magazines or something like that uh, but definitely there would be some kind of writing and it might be it might it might be useful for us to uh, try and track some of those uh, writings about uh, the new green because you know when you when you see plantations for the first time in a place where there is not much tree cover i i don't know whether i'm being absolutely accurate about this or not so please correct me if i'm wrong but i'm pretty sure that when you're seeing so much green there would be a lot of outpouring of literature whether it's oral literature or whether it is song whether it is written i guess you people will have to figure it out but i'm sure it would be would have made a difference and uh, it would be worth following up some of the uh, things that you know uh, in other places uh, which are like which would be more green for example i'm talking about experiences from assam when we were uh, looking at rice growing in the Uh, in the in the in the lower assam area right uh, the traditional varieties of rice 
and the commercial varieties of rice are very different and we know they are different but what does it do to the life of people who kind of grow it and who live out there and it's really interesting to see uh, that when you want to make your kind of uh, local delicacies you use the indigenous varieties you use the varieties you're used to when you're working for commercial for for for, for working to kind of build up family economy or you know a, a livelihood then you're looking 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 at the commercial varieties and in your mind there is a difference between the two and it would be useful to see how the different varieties of trees are seen differently locally kuch to manyatae hongi kuch beliefs hongi which uh, if you kind of follow up will lead to very interesting insights into the history of the area i'm moving from there to let's move to cityscapes and while i'm looking at dav college here because dav college i'm sure uh, a is not only in abohar but in many other places it talks about education and the importance of education and so on but then i noticed i came across on uh, archive.org this gram sudhar natak by the abohar sahitya sadan 1935 and i'm wondering who are these people is there any reflection of these people any more uh, where are these literatures did they all leave at partition because this is a pre partition publication uh, you can see the publication on archive.org in full i have just got the cover page here but for someone who is from abohar or knows the history of the place it will give you lots of leads about questions to ask and people to talk to uh, what were their concerns who were the kind of people they were talking to wanting to meet uh, was it affected by the freedom movement and this whole gandhi thing of village india and so on or was it something else altogether these are questions that could be answered if i look at you know looking at uh, archive.org i mean this is from archive.org and if you look there you can see all the pages like i just said it might be a very useful similarly when you go into any of the college libraries look for all the i would call it simply look for the publications nobody is looking at because wo purane ho gaye but those ones will give you names of people and gives you stories about abor and its surroundings of a time which uh, many of us may not have been alive also and uh, i've often found them very useful sources of information i'm sure some of you some of you are are doing these but uh, since this is like uh, like i mentioned these are certain practices one follows when kind of conducting oral history uh broadly when one is looking at a place there are some phrases that come into my mind you know roti kapda makan jal jangal zameen between these six phrases is an entire world and i find following up on these phrases in different ways in all the variations that you can see when you as i go through this presentation of mine you keep coming back to these six phases uh the very you i mean you can come i mean we can talk about this later when we have a little question answer uh i'll just kind of rush go through the cityscapes again uh you see the melas you see the sukhera basti uh, yogesh gave me this photograph of a mosque which has now become domesticated and it's like partitioned into two houses maybe or more two families or more living there and i'm thinking this is the kind of thing i see a washing machine in this one uh, I, i don't know whether others have noticed it as well there's a washing machine outside the door in one of the past partition portions of this building can you see it and we clearly the on the other side there are more single room things built in the same angan area so clearly very different uh, people of very different social status are living there might be useful to have conversation about how it got divided like this and what happened to the fortunes of each half uh, on one side on the other side is this mela and mela panchpin mela will have people who have been coming there time and again they are very useful source of information 
because even though they are from outside they have been coming time and again into this place and when they do that they observe they may talk about it on the other hand they may not but they definitely remember and as oral historians you got to find ways to trigger that memory it's a very rich source of information i hope the fellows will be there when the panchveer mela happens because it will be a very useful source of information about abhor from who have been coming in there oh uh, i'm just going through my points here i begin through one of uh, the partition memories of abhor uh, again a photograph talking about street number 12 which is the old colonial town and so on there's a mosque there which is now being used as a temple but this remind me of no mosques being used as temples even in delhi and in many other places and i'm sure temples are used as mosques elsewhere and churches used as synagogues and whatever else but the point is if we can find out what this mosque was originally and was it ever used uh, for anything else besides being a mosque or was it just one of the classical uh, situations that happened in partition where uh, it became empty space and you know what was the, what is the phrase uh, evacue property and therefore got uh, used up i mean the evacue property is whether you are in delhi or in abohar or in any other place where there were partition refu- uh, people left their properties behind the evacue property act must have come in and because of that there must be a register and you know the registers of the evacue property if you can even uh, find some of them maybe this day the municipality may be having some of those records tells you about the people who lived there and sometimes it tells you who else used that place you know if there were a variety of uses it does mention it because amongst the various jobs this evacuee property act if i remember right was in order to assess the value of the property it had to look at the various uses that the property was put put to and therefore they had to list it out so i think it was a very it has been uh, sometimes a very useful source of information i do know in bombay they have been doing this and uh, not recently but in the past and a colleague a friend of mine who taught in the university there uh, she had kind of uh, looked at some of these uh, evacuee property registers to find who else and what various properties were used for uh, another of the partition memories uh, here is a nora transformation of residential uh, property spaces post partition but what were they used for who were the kinds of people were they completely different in character or were they people who knew the original owners who moved in there are story lots of stories in there and it's only some conversations with some of the elders that you can uh, assess what happened to this place also some of you know when you're looking at old construction and stuff like this like i can see for in this photograph itself the while the road has been upgraded the walls clearly haven't right which begs the question why it was it so uh, is it because the municipality only decided we will take care of the roads and the rest is not our ambit or uh, did something else happen um, i don't know but it is something that one can find out uh, here photographs from abhor i mean this i have was uh, found on the abhor uh, history project facebook page and there's a conversation there about sharing this photograph and uh, somebody mentioned it's about their abbu and the nanu and something like that photographs are very rich because you can find out about when was this photograph what was the style of dress did everyone wear the same kind of dress or did hindus and muslims wear uh, hindus muslim sikhs wear kind of uh, different outfits uh were uh, how would they, how do different uh, social strata kind of differentiate themselves you know a whole kind of a lot of conversation about dress can come out of a photograph like this if you were to have a studio portrait in the 80s 
what would the dresses be like you can go to a studio photographer and find out to get a get a get a sample and use the two sample photographs to talk to when you're talking to people remember one thing photographs also even if they're nothing to do with the person because they're black and white because they're historical have a way of triggering memory and it's very useful to use these to kind of initiate conversations i was looking at many some of the other photographs on the of our uh, history project uh, page and i was thinking wow some of this will be great material to actually uh, initiate or uh, get into conversation with people uh, where are we now the next one this is uh, advocate intias rashid qureshi chair of the bhagat singh memorial foundation visiting babohar photo shared with me by yogesh and i'm thinking to myself what does he do does he have a do the people from babohar who went over to pakistan talk about babohar what do they talk about this bhagat singh memorial foundation is it something larger than uh, is it as large as bhagat singh is across both our countries or is it something which a group of friends and well wishers have gotten together similarly is there an abohar group out there of people who uh, talk about it maybe they don't have a facebook page but maybe sometimes they used to do talks and speeches and you know memories of uh, growing up and maybe they even brought about dishes kya khana khate the wahan pe and you know uh, somebody makes something i don't know and when i'm talking about all of this it's also We, uh, you know, we 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 saw studio photographs, and we are going to see something else here. We're seeing a marriage. This is clear, uh, a post partition, sometime in the seventies, eighties, kind, sixties, seventies kind of uh, marriage. Does it? Do they happen the same way? Has it always been like this? Uh, Do we did people dress like this? Would it be you know? There's a though they are kind of they dressed in everyday dress. There's a degree of informality, but yet everyone is aware it's an occasion, and there's a kind of uh, wanting to be part of the picture that you can see in the photographs. What do the women think about it? Uh, was there any guy around at all when this photograph was taken? These are uh, it's a conversation that one can start off. Similarly. in this case uh, it's a courtyard of a home in street number 1b i'm seeing kids but i'm also seeing chairs i'm seeing somebody walking in uh, what were the what did these kids play what did they wear uh, these chairs kahan se aaye the locally bane the in which case who made them there's a whole history of actually the making up of a house material culture of a place and i'm sure all of you from abohar would have uh, things from the past lying in your house suggestion would be to actually pull them out and first discuss those pieces amongst yourselves and after that take it out into the public and have like uh, maybe a memory museum in abohar and start with say 12 pieces that you find from your houses and ask people to contribute so that next friday when you meet you have 10 other pieces or five other pieces i mean i remember when we were doing the nizamuddin neighborhood museum we went around asking people and they were saying ki ha mm, we we have but uh, abhi nahi hai hamare paas ha time lagega nikalne mein generally as reticence uh, reluctance to be able to share it with ambedkar university wale kya kar rahe hain even though we had come with some uh, locals because finally nobody is going to talk to me in nizamuddin because i don't live there so i have to go with somebody who lives there who knows the people who i'm going to meet but even then because you're an outsider there's a reluctance to share though may though may have a conversation but they still might be reluctant to share something but when the neighborhood museum started and we started showing the we had printed panels and things but we also had a screen in which we tried to show every photograph that was given to us shared with us you won't believe it on the second day somebody came up to the one of the curators and said आपने तो हमसे कभी बात ही नहीं कि हमारे पास भी इतने सारे फोटोग्राफ्स हैं इमीडिएटली वैसे दिए ले पेन ड्राइव प्लीज हमें दे दीजिए सो एट द एंड बाय डे थ्री वी वर गेटिंग फोटोग्राफ्स एवरी डे व्हिच वी वर प्लेइंग व्हिच डिडंट एग्जिस्ट इन द मॉर्निंग ऑफ द डे 
but were with us by the evening and so on. So we were kind of building a collection about photographs and memories around Nizamuddin in the duration of the pop-up museum. And I'm sure the same kind of thing will happen with you. Once the public gets to see what you've collected and, and you're not secretive about it, it's very, very important. People see that it's open and transparent, what you're collecting and the stories you're putting together, because it's the transparency that will get more people to share. Uh, so, I, uh, and uh, then, yeah. So that that's my kind of uh, collection for now. And now I kind of open it up to questions. I've shared a lot of thingies with you. So please, Yogesh, anybody else, any questions about what we can do with making up these collections of, you know, right now we've just seen photographs and memories, but also one very central thing is objects. Even pulling up a chair like what you see on the screen uh, can bring a lot of conversation in. And I'm sure you must have had when people, amongst people who live there. Thank you.